goes in your gets in your bloodstream, goes through your heart, and goes to your brain, and that's uh, that's called an arterial gas embolism, and can result in paralysis, death, uh, pretty pretty bad stuff. Top side, red diver. I got the patch. We're on one one one. Who you are? That's the one. Okay, green. Okay, green. Okay, stand by. Okay, stand by. Okay, red. Okay, red. We got an unconscious diver on the surface. Tenders lend a hand. But on this kind of job, disaster can strike at any time. So these divers make sure they're prepared for the worst with regular training exercises. Vitals? We got vitals. We got vitals. We keep breathing. We got good bones. Eyes open. Okay. Coming around. Come on, guys. You with us? Yeah. Hey, what happened? What happened? All right. Today it was an exercise, but this is the kind of close call they train for all the time. Up on deck, bomb squad leader Stuart Sachs is planning the sinking. His team will be working in these huge chambers. They contain giant valves called sea chests, which open directly to the ocean, allowing water to enter the ballast chambers. Blowing these valves apart is how they'll flood the ship. We blow in this sea chest here and that sea chest there. We've identified 22 positions and valves throughout the ship. Most of them are in the center. Those are our primary. And there's also some critical locations, both fore and aft. To make sure the ship sinks level, bombs must be strategically placed at structural weak points in the hull. And complete detonation is vital. If the charges are in the wrong place or use an incorrect amount of explosives, the ship could flood unevenly. This would cause her to roll and sink on her side, a disaster for the project. Everything will detonate simultaneously, and the ship should settle on an even keel. We're using a double redundant system to ensure that all charges detonate together. Uh, we don't want to have any charges not detonate, because we don't have any unexploded demolition material left in the ship. This won't be the first time the mighty O has felt the devastating impact of explosives. During the Vietnam War, on October the 27th, 1966, a signal flare accidentally ignited a chain reaction of explosions in the Oriskany's forward hangar bay. Ron Minnick was one of the first on the scene. And when we went in there, the fire was going up the side of the building. We went to turn on the hoses on the side of the um, magazine. And when we somebody hit it with water with the other hose, the magnesium explodes when you hit it. And it just went like it was raining fire. Entombed by armor plating, the men inside never stood a chance. Fire is the most dangerous. Most of the people that died on that fire died from suffocation. They didn't die from burns. Well, they got burned after they suffocated. It was the worst disaster in the Oriskany's history. 44 pilots and crewmen lost their lives. They've been working for three months, and with the hurricane season approaching, the team raced to complete the preparations. But there's a problem. After being chosen to have the Oriskany sunk in their waters, the state of Florida has sent an environmental protection team to assess the ship. The news is not good. But it looks like they want to make the thing a little more diver safe, diver friendly. And bundles of cables such as this that are hanging down, these are the potential uh, All right. entanglement items that we'd like to remove. Um, as well as something like this, I'll go ahead and spray this. Everything that's green has got to go. So they marked out some overhead obstructions and stuff like that. We're, we're running into a little bit of a problem time-wise. We're approaching hurricane season. So we need to either hurry up and get it done 
um, if they want to get this thing towed over the floor before hurricane season kicks in. But it's not just about keeping divers safe. The whole marine environment must be protected. And Florida State wants any polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, to be removed. All of these have to come out. These are, these are called cable trunks, mostly communication cables. We can't use torches because the cables contain PCBs. As soon as you heat them and put flame to them, it'll release them into the air, and then we have a problem. So we don't torch any of them. Everything's done manually with the sawzall or with the cable cutter. We did a calculation, counted wires, length of the island, etc., how many levels, and we estimate that there was probably close to 200 miles of cable in this superstructure alone. A lot more aggravation, but it's what you got to do to get it out right. All of this extra work means that the team missed their June deadline for beating the hurricane season. December 2004. The Oriskany is at last ready to be towed to Pensacola, Florida. The anchors that were buried months earlier have to be dug up and loaded onto the flight deck, along with hundreds of meters of chain. They'll be used to hold the Oriskany in place before she's sunk. She'll be towed just over 600 miles from Corpus Christi, Texas, to Pensacola, Florida. That's where the most dangerous phase of the operation will take place, rigging the bombs that will drop the mighty O to the sea floor. Tonight and tomorrow morning, we have the tugs coming in that are going to pull it out. Monday morning, we'll hook up all the tugs. We'll start heading out the channel. But with no engines, the Oriskany is dead in the water and totally dependent on the tugs towing her. So wind speed is critical. If it blows hard, it'll be too dangerous to leave port, and the forecast is not good. With the ship, it's so tall out of the water. If it's windy, I can't leave. So a lot of it depends on the wind. So I'm going to have all the tugs, all the people, everyone. And if it blows more than 15 miles an hour, I have to start all over again on Tuesday morning. And if it blows again, I got to start all over again on Wednesday morning. The next day, the weather situation is even worse. Well, as you can see today, it's not a good day to go. Today, we've got probably 20 knot winds. We can't leave until it's 10, at least 10 knot winds is the maximum. With all this wind, it's for sure canceled. With all crews on standby, the costs are mounting. It can cost up to $100,000 a day. You have the pilots, the assist tugs, Put some gas in your car, look at the prices today. I've got 10,000 horsepower tugboats. For one day, that'll burn 7,000 gallons. It's $30,000 in fuel. The team must be ready to go as soon as the weather improves. Guys, in the morning, we're all gonna come in at six o'clock. It may be good weather, it may not be good weather, but in the following morning, we're gonna do the same thing until the ship leaves. She's battled foreign enemies and high seas. Now, for the first time in her life, the mighty Oriskany must wait for good weather. In Corpus Christi, Texas, the USS Oriskany is waiting to be towed to her final resting place. The project has been delayed for days by bad weather, but now the forecast is finally good. It's not been an official go yet, but if I had to bet my paycheck on it, we're out of here. <laughs> I'm glad she's leaving. I think we've done everything that we was asked to do. It's time for it to be over. Uh, and I think that we certainly accomplished everything we came here to do. Word comes down, and the job of moving this massive hulk begins. Roger, roger, they're gonna go ahead and cut that cable free. Make sure everybody's and clear. Well, since the dolphin tug is free, I'll just go ahead and cut this one and we're done. Oh, uh, he's done now. Cut everything right now. They're almost on their way. But after removing thousands of tons of precious metals and waste, the ship is sitting very high in the water. 
This makes getting under the bridges in the channel a tall order. The toughest one to get under is this lift bridge right here. I mean, we cleared it coming in, but it was real tight, like six or eight inches. And then we're headed straight back out to the bay and hang a left. There's hardly any room to spare. They have to time the tide precisely. They had a guy up there with a saws all ready to go. <laughs> the team has pumped in tons of ballast water to lower the ship. Now they'll find out whether their calculations are correct. I'll be going about three knots. I'd rather go if it's going slower. The danger is if it's going fast and it hits something, it's going to damage a lot. If it's going slow, it can touch it. It's a huge gamble. Wow. The tugs aim for the center of the bridge. If the tide is too high, the mighty O will rip it down. It's close, but she just makes it. The Ariscone is on her way. She's done. All right. The next challenge is to make it to Pensacola, just over 600 miles away. But as the Ariscone reaches the bay, the unthinkable happens. One of the tow lines has broken loose. The ship's drifting dangerously close to the rocky shore, and the crew frantically try to work out a plan. The 30-ton chain thrashes the tugs. As she drifts without power, the Oriskany is in a perilous situation. Repeated attempts to fix the tow line fail. But finally, the crew succeed in reconnecting it to the tug. After a very close call, they can finally complete the journey to Florida. The Ariscone is docked at last, but now the project is delayed again. The Navy must prove to the authorities that the ship is totally safe to be sunk. And this process takes an incredible 14 months. Finally, in February 2006, they get the green light and can begin the last preparations for scuttling the ship. The naval engineers have developed a plan that they believe will sink the ship evenly and quickly. Holes are strategically cut through dozens of tanks and chambers. The Ariscone was built not to sink because of her side protection system, and she's got tanks on either side of her fore to aft. Uh, if it took a hit in the first tank, you had two more tanks inside to keep it watertight. Or maybe it would penetrate two tanks. You still had one more to keep it watertight. So in the sink plan, what they had us do was fill all of these tanks so they're already full of water. So now all of this protection system is now full of water. We flood around it. Uh, that's why the unsinkable ship is now sinkable. It's all about completely flooding the vessel. The double-layered hull, side protection tanks and thick steel walls must be cut in a precise way to allow seawater to fill the ship evenly and quickly. Once we get out to the sink site, uh, Frank will have some of his people come down in the space and they'll remove all of these patches. Too much water in one side or the other, and the ship will roll over. Our major deal has been trying to pump the ship down, putting all the ballast in it. And we put approximately uh, 15,000 tons of water, which is about 540 tanks that we've filled. 